We are back with another episode of Gatehouse Insights. Today, we welcome back a very special guest speaker, Dominic So. Dom is going to dive deeper into the topics of self-disruption, why playing it safe in our careers is dangerous, how we push past the feelings of adversity, disappointment and setbacks, and the skills needed for the 21st century. Make sure you subscribe to the Gatehouse League Recruitment YouTube channel where you can see more. Good morning, Dom. Good morning, Lou. How are you? Very, very well. Um, I'm so glad you're back on the show. It's always a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. So I really wanted to begin with your view that self-disruption is not a nice to have, but a must have. Could you unpack this for us a little? Yep. So uh, I think disruption has become uh, a buzzword in the recent years, even before the pandemic and even before uh, the recession, uh, because especially when we, we started talking a lot about AI automation, robotics, machine learning and all that. So uh, disruption is not something that is new to us. So the whole notion of uh, the importance of self-disruption is that um, we, we live in a VUCA world, so V-U-C-A. Uh, so VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, things are very turbulent. Uh, things which are unexpected can just uh, turn out around the corner. So in today's day and age, uh, change is the only constant and actually uncertainty is the norm. And the fact is that if... Um, for those who do not disrupt themselves, they actually run the risk of being disrupted by something or someone else. So if we look at it in a business setting, even though uh, if you are running a Fortune 500 company, uh, the greatest threat might not be your uh, rival that is just a few blocks down the road, but it could actually be the, the startup in that garage, which is being run by two teenagers. So uh, therefore, we, we always need to uh, continuously disrupt ourselves. I came across this report by the um, the foundation of uh, young Australians. So, uh, and they did a study about uh, on young professionals and young adults. And they're saying that a 15 year old individual today will experience this thing called a portfolio career. So that person will be going through 17 different jobs across five careers in their lifetimes. So we can see that um, that the nature of work is changing, the nature of careers is evolving. So, um, and if we, we top it up with uh, the, the, the possible threats and impact of automation uh, reports, different reports says that about 25% of the jobs in US are, are at risk of automation. So definitely it's important for us to continuously uh, reinvent ourselves and adapt so that, we, uh, so that we actually force ourselves to change instead of being forced to change I love that I really really love it and I love um, I'm a big believer of constantly disrupting myself of myself so and learning new things so it's it's awesome and it's interesting that so 17 different careers is 17 that- different jobs across five careers wow thereabouts. yeah awesome mm. very yeah very cool um, now a lot of people play it safe and fly under the radar could you share your thoughts on why it's dangerous to play it safe? Sure. So uh, playing it safe can actually sometimes be the most dangerous thing. It sounds paradoxical. It sounds a bit ironic, uh, but it is, uh, it's becoming uh, a reality, especially in today's hyper-competitive and hyper commoditized space because low profile equals to low income. Um, So to give you some examples, if we look at the workforce or the global workforce in general, um, from India itself, uh, across the years from 2001 to 2005, uh, about 12 million individuals entered the workforce every year. So 12 million new candidates enter the workforce, which is 1 million per month. So you can see the nature of how competitive it is. Um, So it's really dangerous because if you're just another face in the crowd, if you're just another worker in your office, if you're just doing what the others are doing, there's little differentiation, which means that you are actually, I'm I'm actually making myself easily replaceable because as, as soon as my boss can find someone or something else who can do it faster, better or cheaper, I'm at a very, very dangerous position. 
right? So the way to deal with this, uh, especially uh, how professionals and executives can navigate this is through developing thought leadership and expertise personal branding. So this means that uh, establishing yourself uh, as the sought after person or as the go-to authority in your space to build up your credibility um, because once you do that you realize that opportunities will start to run to you rather than you having to chase after opportunities so this is the same way like if you're applying for a job if you're undifferentiated it's a very hard game to play if you're just operating at the bottom of the barrel but if you learn how to differentiate yourself if you know your value proposition if you know how you can stand out in your own unique way then you can actually use the odds to, to work in your favor yeah. And you do it so well um, through, you know, social media, you really stand out um, as a thought leader in your space. Thank you. And, and I think you guys are doing well as well, because uh, I see I see Gatehouse uh, producing a lot of valuable video content. So that is definitely one way uh, to reach out to the masses and start to position yourself as the expert in your area to get other experts in the room as well and to start uh, creating buzz and different conversations. How else can someone, I suppose, push themselves out there more? Like there's obviously video content, but what else could they be doing? So definitely uh, writing articles, uh, um, getting into conversations. So um, especially on LinkedIn itself, uh, one easy thing which professionals can do is uh, to have a professionally made profile and to start reaching out to connections in your space and beyond. Uh, so don't just use it as a passive person, uh, be very active and proactive. So for example, if you are in the engineering industry, reach out to uh, engineers in other streams. So not just aerospace engineers, not just mechanical engineers, but also chemical civil engineers and reach out to them in different industries. So maybe oil and gas, maybe transportation, telecommunications, and don't just think of reaching out to people uh, in, in your country. Think about reaching out to people abroad as well. Because uh, if you can reach out to others who are in your exact same role, but operating in a different country altogether, you start to see different insights and perspectives and things from a different angle. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Now, you make a comment that most people are shallow thinkers and they don't or won't think deeply enough when they're presented with a task, challenge or issue. Could you dive deeper into that? So that's a very good point. And uh, I've been guilty of that as well, uh, because it's easy if you don't train the mind, it can go into a very lazy mode. So just taking, taking things as they come. So uh, the example I love to use is uh, if we are looking to, to go to the gym or to work out, to, to work on our fitness. So a lot of people might not choose to, to do it because they only see the surface level consequences of uh, going to the gym. So for example, uh, the, the surface level consequences will, will mean that you have to wake up early, you have to sacrifice on sleep, uh, you, you, have to exert, um, you have to expose your muscles to pain and strain and all that, and you have to uh, stop eating your favorite foods, for example. Uh, and the, the problem is that they don't think beyond that. So there's this individual, uh, Ray Dalio. So he's the billionaire hedge fund manager who founded Bridgewater Associates. So he talks about this idea of first, second, and third order consequences. Right? So if we just think on the surface level, we are only considering the first order consequences, which means the sore muscles, waking up early, dragging our feet to the gym and all that, quite miserable if we just look at it at that level. Uh, but if we dig deeper, so if we press on, if we continue working on it, the second level, the second order consequences will be we'll start to increase our strength, we'll start to increase our fitness, it'll start to make more sense, we'll start to get into this routine and a habit um, of going to the gym. And then if we continue pushing further, we dig a bit deeper, the third order consequences will be uh, we are in a better shape, uh, we have uh, better health, better energy levels, reduce medical bills, uh, more energy for uh, the fun things in life with our friends, family and loved ones. So uh, it's really important for us to transit from first order consequences to the second and to the third. And some of the questions we can ask ourselves is uh, like, what is next? Uh, what does this mean? And what could this lead us to? Mm, okay, that's good. Mm. Now, I want to talk about um, adversity, setbacks and failures because um, they come up all the time 
in our lives, uh, whether in our personal or professional lives. But why do these present us from doing what we actually want? And how do we push past these feelings? Because sometimes they're a bit of a roadblock or they're a, they stop us from doing the things we really, really want to do. So that's a very good question. Uh, and adversity is definitely uh, one of the keywords for, for this year. Adversity, change, or even pivot. Uh, a, a lot of people say that pivot is the dirty word of 2020. Like uh, businesses pivot, teams pivot, uh, processes pivot, everyone's pivoting. Uh, so yeah, so adversity is very interesting. Um, and there, there are several things to bear in mind as to what is hindering us from doing what we really have to. So uh, I think similarly to the first, second and all, uh, third order consequences, um, one of the reasons why many people don't push past adversity is because, uh, like mentioned before in the gym example, they don't see beyond the obstacle. They just see the obstacle in itself. They don't see what's behind the obstacle. Um, so they only consider the first order consequences, which is maybe the, the risk of rejection, the risk of failure, uh, the pain of disappointment and all that. But they don't see the possibility of success. They don't see the rewards behind that. So uh, to actually push through this roadblock, it's really important to think about the bigger picture and to regain clarity of, uh, on your purpose. So why are you doing what you're doing? Uh, what does this really mean for you? Um, how badly do you really want it? And why do you start this in the first place? So for example, if someone wants to start a business and they, um, they sell themselves short or they give up too early, uh, then we need to ask ourselves the deeper questions like, why do you really want to start a business? Is it just because of the money? And then if it's the money, that's fine. It's a good starting point and let's dig deeper. So what does the money mean to you? So if you do attain your financial goals through that business, what does it really mean for you? Does it mean that you can uh, invest in real estate? Does it mean that you can pay for your uh, the tuition fees for your kids to go to university? Does it mean that you can provide for your family and provide good choices for them? Does it mean that you can uh, maybe even uh, spend less time on the business down the road to have passive income so that you have more time for your family? So what does it really mean to you? Yeah, that's good. I like it. Um, yeah. Now I want to, um, I, I suppose moving, moving on to, with that point, a lot of people, um, you know, also seem to care about what other people think, which also prevents them from doing the things they really want to do. Um, and, you know, and myself included, you know, we're always trying to seek approval from others and, you know, caring about what others think. Why do we care so much and how do we break this cycle of constantly seeking approval from others? So that, that, is, uh, that is a double-edged sword, actually. So uh, the fact that we care, it's good because we are humans. So there is this part uh, which is hardwired in us to want to find out what others are thinking about because that will allow us to, when used well, allow us to empathize and to actually put ourselves in the shoes of others. And that is really good if used in a healthy way. Um, so if we, if we turn back the hands of time, uh, this is actually hardwired in our systems. So we have this instinct uh, instinctive social fear or this social thermostat um, for our basic survival because in prehistoric times if we didn't earn the respect the acceptance or a belonging uh, from a group or a tribe itself uh, this means that we'll be left um, to fend for ourselves this means that we'll be left uh, to be exposed to predators and to the elements and this most likely means uh, our demise so you most likely die if you're if you're not part of a, the safety of a tribe so because of this uh, there is this need for us to be accepted so that we can take care of us, ourselves so that we can propagate and reproduce and all that um, but humans have evolved so technological advancement and human evolution so uh, even today many of our primal fears would actually look a bit absurd right now but they are actually still a, a big big obstacle and a stranglehold for many individuals so to actually overcome this unhealthy need for external approval it's important for you to first find security and confidence in yourself so um, gain some self-awareness and also to start building up your self-efficacy so be comfortable in your own skin understand that um 
everyone's imperfect, everyone's uh, work in progress, everyone is human. Uh, and also acknowledge the fact that um, people's opinions uh, might not always be helpful, valuable or constructive. So a lot of times uh, people, they, they most likely are just projecting their opinions and their worldview on us. So for example, if I want to start a business and my parents tell me that it's very risky, it's most likely because uh, in their world, business, is, uh, business and entrepreneurship is perceived as very risky. So they, they are trying to protect me from it. So it's important to really dissect and discern this uh, because if we just take people's opinions at surface value, uh, we might be actually doing this to our detriment. Um, so really important for us to, to see where they're coming from. Yeah. Sometimes it's almost better not to seek uh, opinions from other people and just go with it. Yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, a lot of times uh, it's best to just do it with a pinch of salt. I mean, just uh, just hear them, give them space, be very respectful about it. But if it's not constructive, then uh, just move on. Uh, and also, also see the, um, the credentials of those individuals. So do they really have your best interest at heart? Have they accomplished what you are striving to? Um, so for example, if I'm, I'm looking to uh, work on my fitness and my friend tells me to not push myself too much because I might hurt my body, but if my friend is just spending all day sitting on the couch watching TV, uh, then he doesn't really have credibility <laughs> because he's not, walk- he's not really walking the talk. It's a good, good way to look at it and to yeah d- dig a bit deeper when someone gives you their opinion. So mm, exactly, uh, no. very handy. Mm. Now, now in your view, I mean, 2020 has been quite challenging for, for some okay fathers and, and some people have really enjoyed it. But um, what do you think are the secret weapons and super skills we're going to need to win going forward out of 2020? So, uh, I mean, there are a lot of mainstream skills which have been popularized. So, uh, like digital skill sets, uh, coding, programming, and all that. And those those are really important. But there are also a lot of skills and traits which are pretty much uh, understated. So, um, and I'll, I'll slowly unpack this as we go along. So, one thing which I honestly feel that the Western and developed world needs to be aware of and to be constantly reminded of is the pitfalls of arrogance or hubris. Mm. All right, because, uh, and I'm also, I'm speaking from experience, I'm guilty of this sometimes as well, um, because being highly educated doesn't mean that you are always knowledgeable about things. Having a big title doesn't mean that you are respected and influential in your space. Having past success doesn't guarantee future security because uh, we do have a lot of options. We have a lot of resources at our disposal. And it's sometimes easy to think that we are in a very uh, invulnerable position, like everything's going fine, uh, like nothing can hurt me, nothing can stand in my way and all that. So, when that happens, we, we've got to be really careful. So some of the understated secret weapons are things like uh, humility and teachability. So being, being, being humble, so humbling yourselves to, to be open-minded enough to hear someone else's perspective, even though it contradicts or conflicts with yours. Uh, because um, Johari's window states that uh, you don't know what you don't know. And it is sometimes your blind spots, whether it's in a personal, professional, or organizational setting, that can actually hurt us the most. Mm-hmm. All right. So having the humility and teachability, and then uh, empathy as well. So seeing seeing things from the shoes of others, being able to uh, dispense uh, emotional intelligence when needed, uh, adaptability and agility as well. So uh, making fast decisions, learning how to learning how to learn, learning how to unlearn, learning how to reinvent yourself, learning how to learn things on the fly as well. Um, the next thing is uh, open, open-mindedness open and global-mindedness. So it's very dangerous if you're just stuck in your own bubble, thinking that uh, your world revolves around your role in your company, in your industry, and everything's um, moving on fine, and then you assume that things are going okay. But the world is uh, much more connected 
now. The world is really, everything is almost intertwined. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts. So start to see how you can be part of um, the global conversation. Start to see how uh, you can be part of um, the conversation uh, to do with global mega trends, uh, because we know that if um, there's there's a lot of things happening in the world, so things like people um, people are getting wealthier, people are getting more educated, people want to make smarter choices, people want to make more conscious decisions. So if you're a business owner, think about how you can be part of that conversation. Uh, the next one is diligence and commitment. Um, easy to say. Uh, anyone can talk a big game. Anyone can um, tell the whole world that they want to have uh, lofty goals and all that. And that usually happens on New Year's Day. Everyone has New Year's resolutions. But um, how are they tracking down the road? That's the next thing. So, um, and also the willingness to do whatever it takes. So uh, having, having diligence, having dedication uh, to, to make the necessary sacrifices to make things happen. Yeah. It sounds like, um, and I suppose we're really big on in our, in our businesses that we've got one of our core values is growth and constantly um, evolving and developing ourselves. Hmm. And it's, it, you know, with all these, um, these skills, it's no one's going to give them to you on a platter. You've really got to go out there and, and teach yourself. Would you say that's correct? Or is it like, because people always often look for the quick solution. Just, you know, give me the tablet and it's, um, you know, I've got all this knowledge or I'm, I'm fixed. So, yeah, do you think people need to really go out and, and develop themselves? Exactly. So they need to take full ownership and responsibility for developing themselves because if they don't do that, the opportunities are going to be f- the opportunities will go to those who are willing to. Mm-hmm. So, um, for example, if I'm not willing to work on my career um, and then for whatever reason uh, I'm, I'm fired from my job, uh, it's not my boss or my employer who fired me. It's me who fired myself because I was the one who put myself in that precarious situation. So, uh, very important for us to stay relevant. And I think... Um, we, we also need to save up, guard ourselves against um, entitlement because sometimes we think that uh, it's someone else's responsibility for our career security. Uh, it's someone else's job to bring the customers to our business and all that. Um, so we, we have to be very careful of that. We have to do whatever it takes. We have to be able to put in that the effort. Sometimes it's unglamorous. Sometimes it's unsexy, uh, which is why a lot of people don't do it. They, they just want to do things which are trendy, um, popular, and comfortable, or even familiar. And once the hype um, fizzes out, they stop. So um, it's it's the the consistency and dedication uh, which will ensure that you you stay in it for the long game. Yeah, we have a saying, um, and it's three simple words, and that's I am responsible. <laughs> um, and some people we say that to are very uncomfortable with it, and they all tell us, "I don't like that." Like, no, and, and they. But when, when we look at them and we dig a little bit deeper, they're constantly blaming everyone else for everything that happens to them in their lives. So, yeah. So, and, and to just add on to this, um, I recently saw an interview of uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, and he was saying that I think during one of his staff conference, um, one of the core beliefs he has is that in Amazon, every day is day one. So what this means is that uh, every situation they go into, they always have a beginner's mindset. They always choose to see themselves as having a lot of things to learn. There's always a lot of things we can learn, a lot of things which we can do, uh, a lot of areas to improve. Because uh, if we if we step out of day one, if we enter day two, day two is stagnation. Day two is complacency. Day two is when we start to die off. Day two is when we start to get overtaken by our rivals. So um, very important to have this um, every day is day one mentality. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And I'm mm. going to implement it into yeah. my life. Exactly, yeah. So uh, so whenever whenever we, we make certain decisions or say certain things, sometimes we might not be even conscious about it. We might say it because it's habitual. Sometimes it, it could be like a knee-jerk 
uh, response. So we need to dig deeper as to what's the underlying or the hardwired belief. Because uh, if we are hardwired to think that uh, it is just the way it is, uh, or that's just how we've been doing it here, uh, then we need to start to address that, that, that underlying belief. Yeah. Now, this leads us perfectly into the next uh, topic I wanted to discuss, which was excuses. Because <laughs> I hear them all the time um, and, and I always think, how do we have, actually have so many excuses? There's excuses for everything. So first of all, how do we have so many excuses? And secondly, how do we shift our mindset so we're not looking for excuses or blaming others? Hmm. So even myself, I've, I've made excuses. Everyone makes excuses. If you don't make excuses, you're not human. Uh, it is part of human nature to, to want to... Uh, use all these uh, decoys or this uh, uh, hot air, smoke and mirrors and all that. So um, I think one of the reasons why we make excuses and we love to make excuses, is it's because it distracts us from doing the actual hard work. So the best example is um, making excuses is like sitting on a rocking chair. You know, you're comfortable, you're going back and forth, back and forth. There's a lot of motion, yeah, but you actually go nowhere. <laughs> So it's the perception itself. Uh, or even if you're driving, it's just going around the roundabout. So you might have uh, covered uh, 100 kilometers uh, in terms of distance traveled, but you haven't actually gotten anywhere where there's just a lot of activity, uh, a lot of busyness, but busyness doesn't equate to productivity. So we need to see the distinction. Um, and the other way to see this is um, making excuses and procrastinating should also be seen as a form of arrogance. This is a new idea which I came across not too long ago. And the reason why is because every time we make assumptions, we are actually thinking that we are entitled to having a brand new day the next day. We assume that we have more time down the road. We assume that the next day will be handed to us on a silver platter. So it can be very dangerous because you know anything can happen in life. Um, and the, the fact is that um, when we make excuses, um, we need to understand that one ounce of execution, a small amount of execution is worth more than one ton of excuses. Yeah. So uh, even mediocre execution is best, is way better than exceptional excuses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the way to deal with that is, uh, I call this the art of execution. So ART, so that is an acronym for accountability, reporting and tracking. So accountability means you being responsible for your actions or you being accountable to someone else. So in a team setting, you're, maybe your supervisor or your line manager, uh, you will be accountable to that individual and but you're responsible for every single thing that you do that you do. So that's accountability. Reporting is that you need to communicate your progress. So today, uh, for example, today have I made um, X number of calls to the customers? Have I handled, uh, have I posted out the, 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 shipped out the goods and all that? Have I addressed uh, customer queries within 24 hours? So you always need to report your, your progress and your activity. And uh, T, tracking which means that you need to track your progress and to measure your results. Because if you don't measure your results, how do you know whether you're effective and successful or not? Are you, uh, so are your actions actually aligned uh, to the overall bigger strategic objectives? Are they actually moving the needle forward or are they just, uh, are they just hot air, just um, making your calendar look full but not really achieving anything? Yeah, that's good. I like yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to move on um, to an answer to a question, and I love the, your answer to this question, and I actually thought about it this morning. <laughs> and your question is, how do you make challenges easier? And your answer is, find bigger challenges. And it's, um, I love it. And it was in my head this morning because, because of COVID, I haven't been able to go boxing. And after nine months, this morning was my first. Oh, amazing. <laughs> and I was... Of course, we're doing my, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one pad work and um, it was so hard. And I just kept thinking, I, I kept saying to myself, I wish it was harder. I wish it was harder. I wish it was hard. And it actually, it made it a little bit easier. But I wanted to hear from you whether you can tell us a little bit more about this, this saying. 
Yeah, so uh, it's something which I've used uh, many times before. So, um, for example, when the, the first time I, I ran my first full marathon, which is 42 km's. So usually when people train for a marathon, they go from 5 k's, not maybe they start with 1 k and then 2 k's and then 5 and then 10 and then a half marathon, which is 21. So the furthest I went was 10 k's uh, and then I just jumped straight to to, to 42 uh, instead of doing the, the, the bit in between. Um, so I think, for example, if you, if you want to do a marathon and if you are overwhelmed by it, the best way to overcome that fear is to go for an ultra marathon <laughs> because it makes the marathon itself pale in comparison. So I, I think it's, it's all about perspective and it's up to the individual as to how high they want to aim because when you aim for higher level goals, it forces you to think and to operate on a higher level. And the fact is also that we have no idea as to what we're truly capable of. So um, a lot of people tend to make the mistake of uh, diluting or decreasing the goal when things don't work out. So they think that, okay, because this is not working out, I think I should scale things back so it's more manageable. Um, but instead, what you could do uh, to just short circuit this whole process is actually to increase your effort and increase your commitment to actually go on the offense. And this is something which the top 1% or the top 10% do is that when times are tough, it is actually the, the, the perfect moment to go out there and make a killing and to make uh, to seize the opportunities because people are, other people are being very conservative, they're scaling back. But if you are actually putting your yourself out there it's a great differentiating factor yeah and uh, one other thing I want to touch on is that uh, people tend to avoid challenges because um, they they might have an underlying narrative or an underlying belief system that thinks that sees challenges as being bad. So because of that hardwired programming, whenever they come across challenges, they tend to shy away from them. But in doing that, the consequence is that they miss out on the opportunities that come along with challenges. So in order to address this, uh, it's really important for us to start to reframe things and to see challenges in a very healthy and positive light because challenges is what makes life interesting for example if you if you want to go to university to study imagine if you could just pay a few thousand dollars and then you just get your degree straight away then is there actually any value in the qualification not really right because there's there's no evidence of effort of you having to prove yourself and to go through the hard yards. So, um, so challenges is actually good because it, it allows us to, to push ourselves. It gives us the chance to, to, to become the best versions of ourselves. So, and the other thing is that success is seldom found on the path of comfort. I love it. <laughs> Dom, you're incredible. And thank you once again for joining me on the show. Thank you so much. And I really, really appreciate uh, this opportunity. It's always nice to chat with you about things which are a bit pointy, but I think it's things which are really relevant, especially in today's uh, uncertain times. And that's it. Another episode of Gatehouse Insights draws to an end. Thank you for watching and thank you for sharing this video with your friends. And if you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe to the Gatehouse Legal Recruitment YouTube channel where you can see more.